Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're doing a survey through the book of Acts. Uh, uh, I'm really glad that you joined us. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the privilege and for the opportunity to fellowship together in your word May the Holy Spirit just take this time to speak to our hearts that we might indeed grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. In our Bible survey series, we're in the book of Acts, and we have reached chapter 14, so we're about halfway through. And uh, just to let you know, I think we're going to go into... James after this. We're following the missionary activities of Paul and Barnabas as they come to Iconium. And there they speak boldly in the Lord. We're told in verse 3 that they did enter into the synagogue. They went where God was supposed to be, uh, worshipped in the synagogue. And there they presented the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ, first to the Jews and then to the Greeks. They spoke boldly in the Lord, and it was the Lord who granted signs and wonders to be done by their hand as he had promised the disciples before the word is complete. The city was divided. Some agreed with what Paul and Barnabas were preaching. Others did not. A great argument and a dispute arose. Kind of like what happens among us today. And perhaps maybe you get the picture. So the Lord had a certain man there who had been uh, lame from birth. He couldn't rise. He couldn't walk. He was a cripple and he was born that way. He had never walked in all of his life. In verse 9, he heard Paul speak and Paul looking uh, steadfastly at him. He was fixed on him. He, his eyes, he, would, he didn't take his eyes off the man. And he perceived that he had faith to be healed. That verse is often quoted as proof in the word of God that the activity in your life depends upon your faith. Just like what's happening today. Scripture says that he had the faith to be saved. The word healed there is our word sozo, same one that's translated salvation or saved many other places in the word of God. Obviously, God indicated to Paul that this was one of whom, of, of his people, one of whom God had given faith. So Paul declared with a loud voice, stand up on your feet. And he immediately leaped up and he walked and everybody was amazed and they declared that well the gods must be among us the gods are here uh, plural they called barnabas uh, jupiter obviously an indication of barnabas's apparent power and aggressiveness and they called paul mercury or uh, Mer mercurius because he appeared to be the orator of the group, the speaker of the group. In Corinthians, we were told by the Holy Spirit that when Paul came to Corinth, this speech was contemptible. The word there in the English doesn't really convey the meaning in the Greek that, that his speech was not pleasant uh, to listen to. In fact, one of... Uh, one application that we find in the normal text of the Greek is that he stuttered. Now, it seems unlikely that they would have called him Mercury had he been one who stuttered and had a speech that was difficult to listen to. It seems apparent in the Word of God that something happened to Paul between this experience and the, the comment in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that his speech was contemptible. Could be that this was his thorn in the flesh. 
the more likely possibility is that Paul was seriously injured when he was stoned, as we'll see in a few moments, and never spoke clearly after that. I assume that here is an indication by the Holy Spirit that it is not Paul's speaking ability that makes the Word of God powerful. In any event, they called him Mercury. And the priests of Jupiter came out. You know, they thought, well, here, you know, here's an incarnation of the gods, and they began to worship them, worship the two. And uh, these men cried out, we should never in any way allow any possibility of usurping God's glory and God's sovereign power. You know, kind of like what you'd say to people today. Don't do that. You know, we're men just like you, of like passions. In fact, it's God who had us preach to you that you ought to turn from these vanities, this idolatry, and that you ought to worship the living God who made heaven and earth. He allowed this in times past. He allowed the ignorance of men until the coming of Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, that was the great change in human history. However, he didn't leave himself without witness. He gave us rain. He gave us crops. He cared for us. He gave us fruitful seasons. He filled our hearts with food and filled our hearts with gladness. He was always faithful, even in the pr presence of ignorant men. And we are told in verse 18 that with all of this argument, they were scarcely able to restrain the people from worshiping them and doing sacrifice unto them. Then there were certain Jews that came from Antioch. Antioch was where the believers were first called Christians. And these Jews were antagonistic to the preaching of the word. They felt that it was a destruction of the Old Testament scriptures, that all of that was gonna be, was being replaced and the law of God as well because, because they didn't understand, just like kind of what is happening today. So they excited the people. They stoned Paul, and they left him for dead. And it could be at this time that Paul was injured. You know, what are we going to do? You know, Paul's dead. It's amazing that God would allow this to happen. Whatever they were talking about as they stood around, Obviously, not knowing what to do, Paul stood up. He goes into the city, and the very next day he left with Barnabas, and they fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lies lied around about there. And there they preached the gospel. They preached the gospel. Verse 7. Now, I don't know whether Paul was stiff and sore. The Holy Spirit doesn't give us any indication of one way or another. But surely this is a miraculous healing. In fact, there are many, believe it or not, there are many who believe that Paul did in fact die there and was caught up into the third heaven where he received visions and revelations, which it's not lawful for a man to utter. And that's entirely possible that Paul did in fact here experience a resurrection from the dead. I don't know. I don't know. The only indication that we have of that is in 1 Corinthians when they preached the gospel there. That is after they fled to Derby, then they came back to Lystra where he had been stoned. Surely in, in evidence of the leading of the Spirit and the courage that comes with the proper presentation of the gospel. And when they come back, they confirm the lives, the souls of, of the disciples, exhorting them 
verse 22, to continue in the faith, not their faith, not their faith, not continuing and defending their faith, but continuing in the faithfulness of God, that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God, kind of like what we're preaching here today. I pointed out, dearly beloved, that God gives us tribulation in order to strengthen our trust. It's an easy thing to cease trusting because the way becomes difficult. So there was a constant exhortation there, not the foolish exhortation that living faithfully with the Lord makes everything work out all right all the time. That's, you know, like it is often said. We have been called, dearly beloved, to a life of difficulty. They ordained elders in every church, every assembly of believers, indicating that these assemblies should be governed by the older men of that group. They prayed with fasting. They uh, commended them uh, to the Lord on whom they believed. It's a marvelous verse in, in 23, they commended them to the Lord who they trusted. If we cannot commend fellow believers to the Lord, surely we can't preserve. If God can't preserve them, we cannot. They passed on in their missionary journey, continuing to preach the word. It was always the word that they preached, not their ideas, about the word that Christ lived, that he died, that he rose again, and which is the gospel. Then they sailed to Antioch where they had a great work for the Lord. They gathered the church together. They explained everything that had been done and they stayed quite a while in Antioch. And now some trouble arose because there were men there that came down from Jerusalem and they talked to people saying that unless they were circumcised after the manner of Moses, they couldn't be saved. That certain men, certain men came. Now, I'm not sure who those certain men were, but I wouldn't be surprised if Peter was not among that group. You know, it's interesting how kind and gracious the Holy Spirit is. Paul declares in Galatians that when he was in Antioch, certain men came from James and they caused a ruckus. They caused a dispute there. In the Greek, the word is a heavy, very intense word for dispute. And we read that also when Peter was at Antioch, he ate with the Gentiles, but when certain people came from James, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. Kind of cowardly. Uh, so though he may not have been of the original delegation, apparently he joined with them. We're then told in Galatians, as we read on that Paul opposed Peter John, Paul says, I opposed him, I disputed him, I faced him with a charge. I had somewhat against him, explaining that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of, not in, Jesus Christ. Even we have believed, we Jews, even we have believed on Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. The text says, why do you put a burden upon these men that our forefathers were not able to bear? That's what Paul said to Peter. I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. That's what took place because they argued that unless they were circumcised after the law of Moses, they could not be saved. That seems strange in the presence of the grace of God and the, and the 
death and the resurrection of Christ, yet nothing, nothing, folks, nothing has changed today. We have the same legalism today. There's nothing new under the sun. There are those who argue strongly for the Sabbath, those who, who are argue strongly for water uh, baptism, those who argue strongly for personal invitations and, and on and on and on it goes. We have certain things that are legal for Christians to do and we have certain things that are not legal for Christians to do. Never mind the fact that all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. Forget that. And the organization is as legalistic today as it was back then and should be withstood to the face because they are to be blamed. But we do that in love, dear the beloved. You and I are redeemed by grace, not by law. We, of course, should not use our liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but because it's possible to use our liberty in Christ as an occasion to the flesh, we shouldn't revert back to law. That we shouldn't do. And we can't put people under law to get them under grace. That makes no sense. In fact, when these people came from James, they came in privately to spy out whether or not Paul and his band of his cohorts were in fact circumcised. I mean, that's how rotten it was. Well, this dispute became so heavy, says the Greek, so intense that Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disp disputation with these people. We have a hint of that in Galatians chapter 2. I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now we're told in the next paragraph, somebody said here, hey, this ought to be settled. Okay? It ought to be settled. Once and for all. In Christianity and I believe it was right here in the book of Galatians we are told that Paul and Barnabas went up to Jerusalem and after 14 years I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me and I went up by way of revelation to reveal unto the leaders at Jerusalem the gospel that he preached lest, lest I had run or should run in vain But they who seemed to be somebody, somewhat, added nothing to me, for God respects no man's person. Those who were of reputation added nothing to me. Okay. I believe the Holy Spirit is telling us that what was done at Jerusalem was not done because somebody was a big shot. Not, it wasn't done because someone had a, uh, some kind of reputation, but because the Lord ordained it. We'll see the result of this in the 15th chapter, but bear in mind now, they're at Antioch where Christians were first called Christians. They're primarily preaching to Gentiles and Jews come down saying, well, you ought, you, you ought to obey the law. And one part of that, one facet of that law is circumcision. And if you're, and keep in mind, that's identification. Its purpose was identification. And if you're not circumcised, you can't be saved. A large segment of professing Christianity today is fully persuaded that if you're not water baptized, you're not going to go to heaven. You know, as though the entrance into heaven is the product of something that you may or you may not do. Not at all what Christ has done. And here was a similar argument. Can't be saved. Can't be delivered if you're not circumcised. And just like today, well, that caused a tremendous amount of dispute. Now, there are those who say we're still in this apostolic age, you know, and so it really doesn't matter that the Bible is complete. Pastor Steve, we're gonna go, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do that. It doesn't really matter that the Bible is complete. The Lord Jesus Christ said to the disciples, and I believe that it 
I mean, it's not going at all beyond the scope of what of that meeting, that when God completes his revelation, you don't need these things anymore. But until the scriptures are complete, as we have them today, which they didn't have back then, Paul, Paul was called, Colossians chapter 2, God laid upon me the great responsibility to complete the Word of God. That's what we read. And when the Word of God is complete, signs and miracles and wonders and gifts, those gifts ceased, okay? It is now all about faith. Here they are at Antioch. Paul says, grace, not law. You're not under law. You're under grace. Well, why didn't they read Galatians? Well, because well, he hadn't written it yet. You know, we need to realize that in the book of Acts, we have primarily, by the Holy Spirit, been given a glimpse of that transition that took place between law and grace. And in that trans that transition is the drawing up of some documents. You have those documents. Maybe that's not the way I should say it, but that's the, that's the Word of God. And God used Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, John, uh, Acts. Well, Luke wrote Acts. You know, but I should say the Holy Spirit wrote Acts, but God used these men to complete the Word of God, and the doctrinal completion was with Paul. Okay? But the time you and I are reading that, nobody could go to Antioch and say, you know, well, let's search the scriptures. You know, the only scriptures that they could search were the Old Testament scriptures with Jews who had veiled hearts and minds and couldn't see or understand the magnitude of the grace of God. Even though God declared in Habakkuk that the justified man lives by faith, they didn't understand that. They thought that the justified man lives by keeping the law. Now, we can call them dumb. We can call them ignorant and stupid and all, you know, all of that. But we have to bear in mind, we have to constantly bear in mind in this portion of our survey that they did not yet have a completed revelation, folks. So obviously, we got to turn to a source, some source of authority. Now, what? What they do here, many have taken as a, an illustration of what we ought to do. You know, this is a supremely important passage for the Roman Catholic. You know, you have a problem, where do you go? Well, you go to no high, higher authority than the Pope. The Pope. Papal authority. When he speaks from uh, within his position as the vicar of Christ, then he, well, he can't make any mistakes. Boy, he makes a lot of dumb mistakes, but he's not, he's not supposed to be able to, to make it. He's, he's the last court of appeal. And now we blame the Roman Catholic for that. And, and folks, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. We have the same thing in Christianity. You know, I wonder what so-and-so thinks. You know, this guy thinks. I wonder what this guy thinks. I wonder if this guy's right or this guy's right. Once we have the complete Word of God, folks, we don't need that. And if we begin to trust men, well, you know, what we really ought to do is be very careful because the presentation of the Word of God is so important. It should be left in the hands of experts. Really? Dearly beloved, the expert is the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that one can get up and proclaim the Word of God who has no background, no understanding, just as stupid as a rock, you know, that, that no education, in fact, has never read the Bible. I'm not suggesting that at all. But if, if on the last analysis, we don't appeal to, to the Holy Spirit, but rather, rather to scholarship, I'm, I mean, where, where would we go? I believe with all of my heart and I do, do believe this, that the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. I think He does that. Now you got Paul, you got Barnabas, you got Peter, you got a, a, a delegation from James. 
That's what I'm told in Galatians 2. But when certain men, when certain persons, men were, were come from James, then Peter left the Gentiles and he did eat with the Jews. He used to fellowship with the Gentiles. Now he doesn't anymore. So I got some from James. I got Peter. I got Paul. I've got Barnabas. Uh, probably Timothy and Titus. Man, we got the big guns here. You know, we, we, got, we got the head honcho. We got the, the head quarterbacks of all the top teams. I mean, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. You got the, the weight of it right here. Now, who are you going to listen to? Who are you going to listen to? These guys, they can't read Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. They can't, they can't read any of that. The only court of appeal that they have are the apostles. Whatsoever you bind on earth. I mean, it's already been bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. That's, that doesn't have anything to do with your binding and loosening, okay? The fulfillment of that direct commission from Christ is right here. And if you want to know what's bound, it's not the Sabbath and it's not circumcision. It's not water baptism or any one of another thousand things, you know, liquor or cards or poker or, you know, going fishing on Sunday or, or whatever, or wearing makeup or anything else. It's right here. And I believe that they bound it, and I believe it's bound. Is there law for the Christian? No. You're under grace. But these things are bound both on earth and in heaven. Well, these guys, they said, we got to send... We got to send to Jerusalem. Now, even Paul agreed with that. I get the impression from the Holy Spirit that Paul, Paul was not really certain of the outcome when he went to Jerusalem, but, but they went to the right place because they didn't have a completed revelation. They went to those apostles whom Christ had commissioned with binding and loosening not individually like Peter, but the apostles. So they went up to Jerusalem. The church decided to send them. Verse three, this was extremely important. They had a good trip. Great joy among all the brethren. Boy, we're gonna go up to Jerusalem. We're gonna, we're gonna deal with the very apostles themselves, the ones who walked with Christ, the ones who ate with Christ, the ones who slept with Christ, the ones who really, really knew Christ. In addition to that, the ones who had been given this authority by the Lord Jesus Christ until the revelation is complete, until that which is perfect has come and that which is in part was, is done away. Well, they went. They declared everything that God had done. Now, there were some of the Pharisees there who were Christians. Underline that. Pharisee Christians, okay, who believed, hello, okay, they believed, and they're arguing strongly against the gospel. Dearly beloved, these were believers. They said it was absolutely mandatory that a person be circumcised. The, the apostles and the elders came together to consider this. Now we're at Jerusalem. Now Paul, by revelation, is revealing unto them that that gospel which he preached among the, the Gentiles, lest I had run or even should run in vain, lest, lest what I'm preaching is, is vanity. Paul is preached. And now they lay this before the council. Now, I want you to realize that Paul withstood Peter to the face in Antioch because he was to be blamed. Now, will you note who stands up and preaches? Verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter, you ought to, yeah, you ought to underline that, okay? Peter rose up and he said, now listen, you guys, you are 
talking as though Paul is the special apostle to the Gentile. You know that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth, not Paul, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God who knows the hearts bore them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. Now, before you're too quick to blame Peter, Galatians chapter 2 says that Peter in Antioch ate with the Gentile. Okay, now that doesn't mean he went to McDonald's or Arby's. It means that he fellowship with them in the love feast, in the distribution of the word of God. He did not insist on any Jewish legalism. Legalistic Peter fellowship with those Gentiles. Now the text goes on to say, and, and why? Because God had used Peter to speak to Cornelius. Peter was the first of the apostles to carry the message to the Gentiles. Now the scripture goes on and says, but before certain were come from James, he did eat with a Gentile. But when certain were come from, from James, he withdrew and he separated himself. He separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. And so in Antioch, it was not Peter's legalism, but Peter's cowardice that separated him from the Gentiles. In Paul's dispute with Peter at Antioch, Peter did not get uh, theological education, but courage, spiritual courage. And now he's not in Antioch. He could have continued the fellowship with the Gentiles. That would have taken some courage. But boy, it, it took courage to stand up in the council of Jerusalem and say, you know, it's by my mouth that the Gentiles heard. I was a coward in Antioch. I'm not going to be a coward here. And God who knows the hearts bore them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit the same way that he does us. And he put no difference between us and them. God accepts no man's person. That's what Paul had told Peter. He put no difference between us and them. God, he, God, purified their hearts by faith. God did it. They didn't do it. Now, therefore, verse 10, it sounds to me like he's quoting Paul. Really, he's quoting the Holy Spirit. Now, why do you, why do you put God to the test? Why do you put a yoke or a burden upon the necks of the disciples who are Gentiles, which our fathers who are Jews weren't able to bear? And dearly beloved, that is the theological question of your life. That, that's the theological basis for Paul's dispute with Peter's cowardice because he had been willing to fellowship with the Gentiles before. That is the all important question as it relates to us today in 2023. Or at any time, whenever, whatever time it is. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. That a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ. Even we we proud Jews have had to believe on Jesus Christ. What he says, we believe through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be delivered even as the Gentile. How is deliverance? By circumcision? No. By baptism? No. By keeping the law? No by the grace of Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's the same for the Jew as it is for the Greek. All the multitude kept silent and they listened and they gave Paul and Barnabas a chance to preach. 
and declare the signs and the wonders God had used to verify the message, that the message is in fact true, that it is in fact correct. How do you and I do that today? By signs and wonders? No. We compare what we hear with the complete Word of God, the canon. They could not do that, folks. They couldn't do that. And so God testified to the authenticity of the message in the messenger by the signs and the wonders, the miracles, the, and the wonders that he did, such as the lame man being delivered by the grace of God and the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to give that lame brother of ours in Christ who was chosen in Christ before the, the world ever began, true saving faith. His healing is seen in the context, the context of God performing miracles to validate the message that was being proclaimed to his people who were having difficulty, to put it mildly, with what was being proclaimed. And Paul and Barnabas held their peace. After they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, Verse 18, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. And so James says, listen, let me speak. You've heard what, what uh, Peter said. Verse 14, you've heard that Peter declared that God did visit the Gentiles. Now, if you folks out there, if you have the New King, the New King James Version, it says nations. It's, it's in, it's in, uh, uh, it's Gentiles that God did first visit the Gentiles to take out a people for His name. Now we've heard that the te the the Testament the 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 Scriptures agree. I read after this, I will return and will we'll build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I'll build again its ruins, and I, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the nations upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God are all these works from the beginning of the age. So there it is. Don't trouble them among the Gentiles who are turned to God. You didn't say too much about the Jew. We don't trouble them. However, there are certain things that we believe that we should bind. Abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. The amazing thing is that basically we as Gentile Christians do that today and should. I'm, I'm not saying that that's the, the difference between heaven and hell. I'm saying that's what has been bound 
and nothing more. But what's recorded right here, Moses is preached in every synagogue. We got the Old Testament scriptures. That's what verse 31 or 21 says. For Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him. All he's saying is we have the old covenant. What we need is the new covenant and it's going to happen. It's coming. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part, it'll be done away. But it's not here right now, but it's coming. And that pleased the apostles and the elders. And so they all got together. They all get together and they say, we ought to write this down. We ought to send this out to the churches. It seems good to us. So we write a letter, we make it very formal. So they did that and they sent it by men who had committed their lives to Jesus Christ. Verse 26, men who had hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore they sent a letter and they sent men to carry this letter in verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. I believe that God is telling us here that what is written is what God intended to be written to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And I supremely believe that this is the binding of Matthew 18. And no elders, no fellowship, can bind you any further than that you abstain from worshiping idols. That is that you do not worship man, but God. I do not believe the Holy Spirit is, e is inf even inferring that these things are necessary for your redemption. But if you want to know what God has bound in the life of the Christians right here, well, it's there. Idolatrous practices, blood of things strangled. Now, you, you don't want to get that, mi that mixed up. That simply means that if the animal is strangled, it didn't have a chance to bleed. So you're going you're gonna to eat the meat with the blood. Things strangled from fornication. The word is pornea. It would be the easiest thing, I guess, in the world to suggest that all that means is just, you know, what it means. It's just evil fornication. Pornea is the word from which we get pornography. You know, illicit sexual activity. And surely that's true. But if we look, folks, if we look at the verse, idolatrous practices, we understand because God has sanctified the blood, declaring that the, that the life is in the blood. So if we take fornication simply as the physical, and I'm not, I'm not saying it isn't, I'm not. I'm simply saying that that's not all it means. It's supremely important that we also are not spiritually fornicating. In fact, it's articulated in the Greek, the fornication. That was Israel's great problem. They trusted the Lord God, Jehovah, and they trusted Baal, Baal. I, you know, we might as well try them all, I guess, you know, right? You know, maybe one of them will work, you know, and they, and they not only instituted idolatrous practices, but they fornicated between Baal and God, and God calls that more horrible than the physical. I believe we should abstain from both. If you, if you keep yourself from these things, you do well. Our text says you do well. Not that you are redeemed, not that this is a way to gain heaven, but this is good advice from God Almighty. I think it's good to take God's advice. We don't want some awful physical activity to reflect in our lives to reflect some much more awful, deeper spiritual reality. Spiritual fornication. Now, I'm scripturally persuaded. You don't, you don't have to take God's advice, but that seems like a foolish thing, the decision to make on your part. 
So they were thrilled. They went back to Antioch. They gathered the crowd together. They delivered the uh, epistle and the believers uh, rejoiced because of this consolation that that's all there is. And, and not only that, it isn't even law. Uh, doesn't, doesn't, uh, you know, law doesn't, doesn't say you got to do this. You get, if you don't, you got to do this or you're going to get kicked out of the church. Doesn't say that at all. It says this is good advice. You'd be advised to take it. And so Judas and Silas being uh, prophets themselves exhorted the brethren and they uh, confirmed them. And I believe that's in the word of God. They stayed there a while and then they left and Silas stayed there, but Paul and Barnabas continued in Antioch preaching the word. And now Paul said to Barnabas, well, let's go and let's go visit our brethren in every city, you know, where that we preached the gospel, preached the word of God. And let's just go check on them. Let's go see how they're doing. Boy, we got super news now. We have apostolic vindication of the message of grace. You know, it's what we've been preaching. Not a different message, but man, I mean, we just we just ought to go back and see all of these brothers and sisters. And here's where we have a dispute between Paul and Barnabas. Paul didn't want to take John Mark because he didn't well he didn't think he was a faithful servant. Uh, Barnabas did, and so they separated. I don't know what inferences that you want to draw from that. There are, there are uh, all kinds of them. You probably have a footnote in your Bible that it's the last time that we hear about Barnabas in the book of Acts. You know, the inference seems to be in the, in the footnote that Barnabas was wrong here and Paul was right. I don't know that. You don't know that. Surely we, we wouldn't conclude in the book of Acts that the only preachers of the gospel were Paul. You know, Barnabas, he tried. <laughs> you know, and Timothy, well, he didn't try at all. You know, Paul was a great preacher. Peter and James and who knows how many others. There's thousands of believers now. And I think the fact that, that you no longer hear of Barnabas, Barnabas is is not so much an indication of, of the Holy Spirit that Barnabas was wrong and he, he just really messed up, you know, and his life now is just completely shot as a minister of the gospel. Not at all. I think that what we're seeing is the Holy Spirit's vindication of Paul being called to complete the word of God as we saw when we were told directly in the epistle to the Colossians. Well, that's where we're going to stop for now. Uh, I love you all. I truly do. Stay warm. Keep looking up. Until next time, this is Steve. Rest in him. Thanks for watching.